around that. Uh, my name is Justin Krieger. I'm one of the partners here at Financial Planning. Uh, but I'd like to introduce the adaptive team. Uh, and we talk a lot about their qualifications. Uh, professionally, I'm going to talk about uh, personally just uh, why we appreciate them and why they're great teammates. So Dan, I'm still getting to know Dan, uh, but I've been told Dan is just steady. Nothing really rocks him. Uh, so that's, we love that. Uh, he's also very faith oriented, very involved with his church, uh, which we really appreciate. Uh, Ian is hard working. Uh, we have to almost make Ian take time off. We do it, in fact. So we really appreciate Ian and how hard working he is. Also, uh, when we're working on uh, difficult projects and adversity, Ian has a great sense of humor. He, you know, he's going to mix it up and make us all laugh. Kevin, uh, Kevin is very loyal and very knowledgeable. So, Kevin has been with us. He's our first like college hire, a long time ago. I don't remember when. Six. So. Kevin has done many different um, responsibilities, so he just has a wealth of knowledge. And Kevin's normally the first person in the office, and he has the longest drive to the office, uh, which is awesome. Uh, Dave. Uh, Dave's a fierce competitor and a consistent coach. So a lot of you guys probably don't know, but he was a quite a good football player back in the day. And uh, he's really good at coaching up our team at Klein First. And in his family time, he coaches baseball and most recently varsity girls soccer. So just, uh, I know all these things about our team, but I just thought I'd share today. Excellent. Thank you for the interrupt introduction, Justin. We're going to kind of tag team up here. Kevin's going to be coming up shortly. Uh, but the other thing I, I really appreciate about this team is they work well together. Um, when Justin talks about coaching and being a fierce competitor, you're really only as good as your teammate. You can be a really great star player, but if it's just you, I, we played a team the other day. They had this fantastic girl, so this lady soccer player. She was fantastic, but she had no one else. But I gave her, her name was um, Tamalia. I give her a lot of credit because she was out there on the field coaching. She was trying to help these girls get better. But really, these guys here help carry the team. They do a great job. I always have to bring out the legalese, right? We, I know most of, most of you, we know your financial situation, but we also have to highlight that some of you we don't, and therefore we have to make sure that we disclose that this is just for educational and illustrative purposes only. So this part of the presentation, when we talk about our true holistic process, we're really talking about how does the picture unite together between your tax situation, estate planning, social security planning, Medicare planning, your investments, and insurance? Today we are going to be talking about adaptive and investments, but I do, if I could, ask for a round of applause for our tax team. <laughs> Yesterday was tax day. For some it's a smile day, for some it's a frowny day. But our tax team grinds is the way I like to describe it. Lots of long hours trying to make sure they're doing right by you guys. Many of you here have your taxes done by our tax team and they sincerely thank you. They set a new record uh, this year in serving others about 1,500 tax returns. Yes, thank you. I will pass along your applause to, to them. I know they would appreciate it. They are now exhaling. <laughs> So on our agenda today, we have a lot to cover. So kind of the game plan is, Kevin and I are going to cover some topics up here. Dan's going to come up. Ian's going to come up. If we have enough time, we're going to do a, a, a panel Q&A session if we have time. If not, I'm going to send the team back to make sure we're taking care of our clients uh, related to the market. And I will hang back for about 15 minutes if people want to mingle and have questions for me. And then I have to head back to it. But we have a lot of things, exciting things to cover, such as Kevin's going to cover how do we, let's look at bear markets, what, what do we know about them, and what are their behavior? What are two types of corrections? They're not just one type of correction. What are the two types of corrections, and how do they impact assets, and how we manage assets? 
So range-bound markets, you're going to hear this a lot today, which we've been in since May of last year. And in some instances, much, much longer in some, for the average stock and the average return since 2018. Now, they can be frustrating, but they can also provide an opportunity, and we'll cover that today. Seasonality, Kevin's going to cover some of the things we talked about in January and where we are today. Dan's going to come up and talk about the relationships that matter. Ian's coming up to talk about some of the important levels in the market that we want to be looking at now that we have some definition behind us. And then if we have time, Q&A. So, and then we'll have some housekeeping and final thoughts. So with that, I'm going to bring up Kevin, who's also a fierce competitor, big-time football player, hockey player, and I would say a sharpshooter with humor, so please pay attention because he likes to throw the, the darts in there, and you got to be ready. All yours, Kevin. Thank you. So being uh, the lowest one on the CMT totem pole, I got to talk about everybody's favorite topic, bear markets, right? It's fun. It's a good time. Uh, so as Justin alluded to, I did have somewhat of a trivia question, if you want to call it that, for Dave. So Dave, do you happen to know where the term, or I guess the joining of bear market came from with bears and markets? Believe it or not, this is not a planned question. So you're asking me why it's called a bear market? Mm -hmm. I told him this would be coming. I didn't tell him the answer, so this should be good. Okay, so if it were my guess, it would be bears hibernate. So if they go to sleep for a while, so if the market goes to sleep for a while, that would be my guess, just the same as a bull plows ahead and it's it, it plows the ground and it's fertile. Those would be my... It was a good effort. It's actually better than I thought you'd do. And really, there's a couple ways you could answer this. So that was pretty close to one way. Not the way I was going. Does anybody else maybe know? Have a thought? No. Because it, it doesn't make us hungry like a bear? Well, I'm hungry because I saw the food today, but that's not yeah, related. So actually, um, if you go back to the frontier days, um, obviously... Skins, first pelts, things like that were a big commodity trade item, right? Um, so part of that whole process were individuals that called jobbers. Uh, basically, those people were kind of the inter inter intermediaries, excuse me, um, of those buying and selling those goods. So back then, they had bearskin jobbers, and what they would do is they would go to the buyers at the beginning, essentially the hunting season for bears, right? And what they would do is they would sell these skins up front, you take all the orders, right, as the hunters were just starting to uh, kind of collect all the skins. And then at the end of the season, what they would do is actually buy the skins from the hunters, hopefully at a lower price than they already sold them to, and make delivery. So this should sound familiar to a, uh, a market um, action or dynamic, which would be... Supply demand? Yeah, and short selling. Yeah, short selling. So essentially they were shorting bear skins, basically sell them before they had them, right? There's actually a, I don't know if you want to call it a proverb, I can't actually even remember 100% of it goes, but basically it was don't sell the skin of the bear before you have it in hand, essentially something like that. Um, so basically that's how they made the connection between if you're shorting something, you're profiting if the price falls. There they were profiting if they could buy them at a lower price if it fell between the time they sold them and bought them. So that's where the connection comes from. That is awesome. Man. We should just end right here. That's all I did this morning. That was, yeah, that was it. So what we're going to look at here, um, this is a kind of a graphic from First Trust. It's of the S&P from 1942 to roughly current date. It's not totally up to date. Um, but basically what this does is, one, it tells us exactly, I guess, the definition of a bear market. So really, all that is, hold on, Calvin, it shakes the screen. Um, Be ready to go old school. <laughs> duck and cover. Yeah. Um, so bear market, what is it? Um, basically, if you take your highest close to your lowest close, it has to be um, a loss of 20% or greater. That's really all it is. Um, so kind of over time, you can kind of see roughly the frequency that these have happened throughout history. Um, you can kind of get their magnitude, too. Uh, I know Garrett says it's roughly an average of around 32% loss. So you can kind of see that here. And if you go back past, further back from 1942, 
Um, I mean, as you go back in history, there's always been bear markets. So roughly kind of what we want to focus on is a, how often do these occur? Um, so if you go back, run the average, this 20% correction is the start of a bear market, and you would expect to see those roughly every four years. Um, I know we've said it before, every three to five years, expect a correction roughly around this 20% magnitude. Um, so interestingly enough, if you look at the last five years, which I'm just starting to realize is roughly when I started here, right? Maybe this is my fault. We've actually seen three of these kind of bear markets and corrections of 20% or more. Um, so if you compare that to the average of every four years, you can see that that doesn't really match up, right? Um, so kind of the first one we're going to look at here is in 2018. Um, and I guess I'll ask you this question. It's even not even a trick question. Um, was this correction in 2018 a bear market in the S&P 500? Not quite. Not quite, exactly. Yeah, so if you take the close to close, we're actually just shy of 20%. Um, if you look intraday, we were actually over that threshold. So if you're asking me, that's close enough. Um, I would say you're splitting hairs at that point. You almost got to the finish line. Um, so that's kind of why we're throwing that in here. Um, so this is the S&P 500. Um, not only that, but if you look at the NYSE composite, so a larger picture um, of stocks, same thing. Three corrections, 20% or more yeah. in the last yeah, five years. What's the difference between the S&P 500 and the NYSE? In inclusivity? Is that the right word? Sure. I mean, you're, you're getting a, uh, you're casting a broader net, um, if you will. It's, it's, more, it's, more, the it's more the stock market, more right. the stocks. Because what is it, 2,000, 3,000 constituents? Yeah, somewhere around that 2,000, 3,000 mark. So when you think, you know, what, the S&P 500 now is around, it's closer to 600, isn't it? Or a little over 500? 505. 505, okay. Yeah, so there you go. Um, not only that, so Dave will actually kind of touch on this a little bit later too, but the value line geometric index, it's kind of like we were talking about before, a wider net. Basically what you're looking at here would be essentially your average stocks, average daily change yep. return. Um, so you can actually see here too, it wasn't just the S&P 500 um, that saw these issues. Um, really, we've had these corrections kind of across the board over the last three years. So let's think if you, you know, three times you're getting 25%, 45%, 30% corrections out of your average stock, that's, that's significant. So this graphic here actually goes a little bit further back than the first chart. You can actually see it goes back to 1929. Um, one thing I kind of want to point out here, so if you look on the far right, this would be kind of your length of the bear market in days. So if you average that up um, to current date, it's roughly 11 months they last. And what you can kind of see here, if you look over this um, five-year period, uh, these bear markets have actually been shorter in length. Uh, they didn't take as long to develop as they generally do, um, which I think has also been significant. Really not even necessarily that close, except for now, depending on how this pans out. I mean, it's a little more Yeah, we're going to get, yeah. get into that in a second. Right. I don't want to jump too far ahead. But if you look at the one here in 2020, that was actually the, the shortest duration bear market in history, at least in the S&P 500, which is interesting. And actually kind of what we were talking about this at the office a little bit before too, if you kind of scan these columns, um, the further back in history you go, and even if you went past here, you would kind of see a little bit of a higher frequency of bear markets and corrections like this than you really have since 1970 onward. Um, so I guess I don't know, is that a coincidence? Are we kind of getting back into a market environment where maybe these are a little more frequent? Only time will tell. But with that, I will let Dave talk about the two different types of corrections. Thank you, Kevin. That was great. I, uh, I love that trivia. No longer about hibernation. So when we talk about corrections, it's not only about price. Corrections can also happen through time. 
And sometimes those can be even more frustrating than corrections through price, and here's why. When the COVID crash happened, it happened in 26 days. And chances are, because your focus was elsewhere, you never looked at your account. When you have a 12-month period where the market's doing this, that can become very frustrating to see ups and downs and fluctuations and drawdowns happening. So I wanted to cover the difference in these and what we're seeing. Kevin talked about the 1929 crash, <clears throat> minus 90%. Um, Kevin, my trivia for you is, um, what is minus 90%? Except you have a calculator on first one. So depending on how you do this, um, to get to minus 90% kind of looks like minus 80%. And then if you go down another 50%, that's your answer. What do you guys think about that? Is that correct? You have $100. It drops 80% to $20. Then cut in half to $10. So it's minus 80 minus 50. That should paint the picture of compounding on some of these bigger drawdowns that have happened. In the S&P 500 in 1974-75, that was about 50%, 2000, 2003, and 2007, 2008. People are familiar with those periods. I don't have to talk about them ad nauseum. 50 and 57%. 2020, Kevin covered that, minus 35% in 26 days. That's, that's price correction. Yes, they took time. Kevin talked about duration. They invariably they take time day to day to day, but corrections can also be greater in magnitude. So when we talk about the current environment we're in, there's really a scenario that I want to try to drive home, and that's that most stocks have been in a correction since February of 2021. February of 2021. So we're over 24 months. And you'd say to me, well, Dave, in 2022, S&P was up. It finished up. S&P is not the whole market. S&P is a cap-weighted product. Top 10, 15 stocks can equal up to 30, 35% of the index. So yes, the S&P was up in 2022, or I'm sorry, up in 2021, but down in 2022. So correction, the S&P starts in 2022, but the correction for most stocks actually starts February of 21. ARC invests, very popular investment vehicle. Some of you may have heard of Kathy Wood. She invests in, in technology stocks and small cap tech. That particular drawdown, minus 81% since February 2021. IPOs, initial public offerings. This is when companies come into the market to raise funds. Maybe they got as much money as they could from the bank. Now they're going to go to capital markets, issue stock, receive that money to try to grow their business. So these tend to be carry a little more risk because they're newer companies to the market, down 68% since February of 2021. Marijuana stocks, whether you like marijuana or you don't, I'm just gonna talk about the stocks. They're down 91% since February of 2021, which is minus 80, minus 50. Innovation stocks, so again, these are your, like, we're a high-tech economy. This is beyond, Apple is no, my argument is Apple is no longer a tech company. How many of you have an Apple phone? Okay, how many have, like, a Samsung? Okay, so, but everybody here has a phone. It's a utility now. Everybody, everybody out here has a car in the parking lot, most likely, if you walked here, congratulations. But if not and you have a car, that's a utility. It's something you're expected to have to live your life. These are true tech companies. This isn't Apple, this isn't Google. Those are big cap utilitarian uh, companies. Down 65% since February 2021. Now, when we look at corrections through time, so we talked about corrections through price. If something rises in price and then moves, moves sideways for 10 years, that's also a correction, that's 0% over a certain part of time. In 2011, we had an 11% range that was 75 days long. And what I want you to focus on at this moment is the size of the range and the duration. Duration just means how long was it? Because we, we went all the way back to the 1920s looking at different ranges, their size in, in depth, and also how long they took. 
So, for example, 2015-2016 had a 15% range in 425 days, so over a year. Kind of frustrating. The bottom in 2002 and 2003, that's about as close as we'll see uh, compared to 1973 and 74 to today, to where we are today for the past 10 to 12 months. So you'll notice, too, that they occur at different times, meaning 2015 and 2016, this range happens and then it continues upwards. This range happens at a bottom. This range happens in the middle of a decline. This range happens at a bottom. This range happens at a top. So ranges are a natural part of markets. I don't want to make it sound like they're not. But they have different levels of duration. And what we've had here, I'll use the value line geometric index. If you think about it, the average stock's average daily return is flat since 2018. Now, January 2018 is easily forgotten. What were you doing in January 2018? I can tell you an important event happening in my life, besides my pop's birthday, is there was something called Volmageddon. Have you guys heard of this? Okay, you would have back then. January 2018, there's these volatility products that are put together by bigger banks, and you could bet on what's called the VIX, the, it's an instrument issued by the Chicago Board of Exchange. And the VIX is just the measurement of how volatile is the S&P 500 going to get be. And by betting on short volatility, meaning volatility is going to decline, people were making a lot of money using these products until they blew up. And since then, we've been more volatile. That's the irony. We've been more volatile like the things that Kevin talked about. In addition, the bank that issued the two biggest products in this field on shorting the VIX was Credit Suisse. Anybody know what happened to Credit Suisse recently? Recently taken over by UBS. So some of these, and that's a huge financial institution that's been around for hundreds of years. So we're finally seeing some of the reverberation play out five years, four to five years later. That's how long sometimes these things take to play out. The other thing I'd like to highlight is the Russell 2000 since February of 2021. We have a sideways range of 340 days, 12%. Then we correct minus 33%. And then we're in a 19% range that we are in currently today that goes back 355 days up for a total period of 820 days. So we haven't necessarily seen a market environment like this for quite some time, and we've never seen something with a depth, meaning this long for this much volatility. Here's the S&P 500. I call this scare you out, wear you out. So minus 26% going into uh, April, May, and then sideways. About a 20% depth, 18% depth on this, and about 355 days. And this is where I kind of want to talk about some things about adaptive because I, I have a really smart client that I respect that visited me up front and was asking questions. He's been with us for about a year, and he's like, my account has suffered during this time. And so part of that has to do with when we're in sideways trendless markets, adaptive doesn't perform great because it's a trend-following system. So uptrends, great. Downtrends, great. Side trends, not as great. But we know that from ranges, from hard markets, come easier markets. What I'm thankful about is that we finally defined this period. Because you don't know these things before you get into them. And here's what I'm going to try to make some connections in your brain on this particular subject. So while lifting and running can be frustrating, typically in the moment, they pay dividends later. Right? Like, if someone asks me as I'm lifting weight, like, hey, you like that? No, I don't like it. The next day I like it because I feel better, feel stronger. Same thing with supply and demand and Bayesian inference. Those are big terms, and immediately your eyes want to roll back in your head and be like, ah, I can't process this because he's saying words I don't understand. Law of supply and demand. More supply than demand, what happens with price? Falls. More demand than supply price 
goes up. So that's the law. There's no theory on this. This is exactly how it works. It's like gravity. It's there. It exists. Bayesian is this concept that as you get more information and evidence, the more likely you are to have an idea of the outcome. And I'm going to go through an example here. The next page for you should be a green grass and nothing on it. Everybody on that page? Okay. This is us being ESG green? No. I'm sorry. We're also getting close to lawn mowing season, so if you haven't gotten all your lawn mower service, now would be the time. So what, the, the example I want to go through on what is Bayesian, what, what, what does he mean by this, and why is this important regarding this range? So imagine you show up on this field, okay, and then someone starts painting lines. So they're not on yours. I kept them out on purpose so we could guess together. Okay? What game are we playing? Okay, football, soccer, baseball. baseball. See, I think baseball is a possibility, right? Because if these are the foul lines, and this is like the opposite of Fenway Field, and they got a short right porch, this is possible. That could be the pitcher's mound, but it's offset, so that doesn't seem right. So I don't think it's baseball. Yeah, that's the ball. Tennis isn't played on grass. Well, it can be. I think, uh, what is it, Wimbledon? What's, yeah, there's one that's played on grass. Okay, now, okay, we have some borders here. This is good. This is getting a little bit clearer. We know it's not baseball. Soccer's a good guess here. Could be cornhole too, right? That could be, so we're getting more, we're getting more information that's giving us a, a bigger clue on what's going on here. Oh, yeah, see, that could be pickleball. Or soccer. I think soccer is still in play. I'm a soccer coach. It looks like a soccer field. Now I'm thinking it's tennis again. What in the world? Anybody know what this is? Not basketball. Lacrosse. Lacrosse. So now we have more information, but as we're going along, there's unknowns until you get a fuller picture. And that's called Bayesian inference. And where am I going with this? Since May of last year, the market has been carving out boundaries to give us an idea of what's going on here. So in June, middle of June 2022, we don't really know that we're about to go into a 10 to 12 month, 20% range. We don't know that. August, I would also argue, we don't understand that we're in a range. We understand we're in a downtrend. In fact, adaptive outperforms during this period. We're actually flat to up here. Here, we clear this 4,200 area. Things are looking like similar to out of COVID. Maybe we've cleared, maybe this is it. We're moving higher. We're grabbing onto a new trend. False. By October, we know that 4,200, 4,180, extremely important because of supply of law and demand. More selling than buying, what happens? Price falls. So we know there's sellers there. Sellers, thunder. <laughs> okay. I didn't even put that on the presentation. Um, by March... 17th of last month, now we know what our field is. So sometimes you enter market environments and you're not sure what you're dealing with. And really, to be honest, I can't sit here and say the market's going higher or lower from here, but we have a game plan for that. So as you can see, selling keeps happening at this 4180, 4200 level. You guys probably get sick of us talking about it. But I like highlighting where adaptive struggles, and then when it outperforms. So in green, adaptive, outperforms, it's capturing uptrend. In red, outperforms because it's avoiding downtrend. But when we get in these ranges, we're directly off a of bottom. If you think about our process, if we're holding cash at the bottom, which we don't know is a bottom, right, going back to our last chart, in October, we don't know this is a bottom. Lots of cash being held here. So we're never going to catch an exact bottom. 
So in the black boxes is where you'll see adaptive underperform. And it just so happens that's been 12 months and very frustrating. So I wanted to highlight that for you guys on why that's taking place. But also highlight that this isn't my first rodeo. From these ranges comes opportunity. I can't tell you directionally which way. I wish I could, but I can't. But we know, if you're, if you're familiar with some of the things we've talked about, whether it's in the market letter or um, the podcast or some of our presentations, first step is we had to get above this 200-day moving average, which we have done. The second step is we have to get above this 4180 to 4200 level. It's, it's simple math, right? If there's enough demand to outpace supply, we'll get above that level. And then we need to stay there. So right now, across the models, depending on risk, the more, the more risk that it carries, the more exposure it will have. But they're lighter than they normally are. Back below 200 day moving average, super light. Below these levels, we want nothing to do with stocks. So we now have a field of play. Above that field of play, we can be aggressive. Below it, we can reduce. If we continue to move sideways, we can be in the current position that we're in, knowing that we're in a range well mark. Now that I've covered ranges and corrections through price and time, Kevin has updates on seasonality. So fitting day to have these pictures on there, I think. Um, Lake Spring in Wisconsin, you get to see many different seasons. Markets have many different facets of seasonality as well. So the Robins, I think, have not been too happy this year. Or probably not too happy today, really, either, I wouldn't think. Yeah. Um, so we've kind of touched on these first parts before. So at the beginning of each year, um, there's kind of three main seasonal points that we always like to look at. Um, so we have the Santa Claus Rally, the first five days, and then essentially January as a whole. Um, so each of these three individually, if you look at them, have different statistics, probabilities, things like that, um, that kind of pair with them on kind of what the year from this point on will look. But we're just going to look at these three together. Um, so the Santa Claus Rally, last five days of December, first two of January, pretty good. 80 basis points, positive, that's a good sign. The first five days of January, really pretty good, 1.3%. Can't shake a stick at that, right? January as a whole, really strong, 6.18%. So we got the trifecta there, if you will, all three positive. So if you look at times throughout history where all three of these periods are positive, 93% um, of the time, the market's finished up and then 2 to 18 percent uh, pretty good annual return so at least as far as kind of early season seasonality um, definitely a positive look I think for the rest of the year uh, but kind of around this time of the year too we have post midterm elections right we're heading into um, well now it would be like a pre-presidential election so there's seasonality that goes with that as well um, so if you look at those seasonality factors if you get to this table here, um, there's a lot of numbers. Uh, really, we're just going to focus on these last two columns here. So what this is, is it looks at performance related to kind of the time around midterm elections, um, which we just went through not too long ago. It goes back to 1962. Um, so if you look at the second to last column here, what this is looking at is performance from the end of midterm elections six months out. Okay. So if you kind of scan through that table, there's a couple things you can see. It actually averages it at the bottom. So during those time periods, six months out, you're seeing an average of 15% return, which actually kind of matches up to what you would kind of see with what we talked about before um, for January seasonality. Not only that, all these periods listed here are positive, which is actually kind of mind-blowing if you think about it. Um, not only that, if you look at this last column here that goes from the same starting point in November, out 12 months, so a full rolling 12 months, same thing. All positive here, around 16%. So, so Kevin, is that November of for, uh, for sake of this illustration of last year? Right. Yep. Got it. Yeah, so essentially what we're nearing in now, right, current day, would be this first column here. Um, so if you look at November last year to current day, as of this morning, it was around 
I wrote it down. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. It was like 6 7%, something like that, I think, roughly, of where we're at now, um, positive. So, like, kind of, I guess, on the lighter side of what you would expect here, but still in line. Um, so some yeah. of the data, seasonality, both from the trifecta and this leads us to be open-minded to higher stock prices. Right. Okay. Even though we're going into a recession. Mm-hmm. Okay. I know it's confusing, right? Yeah, and that and that's something too with especially with seasonality, right? What is probabilities? Um, it's nothing you really want to go bet in the mortgage or the house on, um, but it just I mean it keeps an open mind, um, especially when those percentages are as drastic um, as, these, as these kind of seem to be. Well, and, and the appropriate way to use seasonality would be we're open minded to upside. It would be if the market does the opposite. Right? It's kind of like last week was July here? No, because we got this week. So being a, a paying attention to when things change and don't match their season, we want to pay attention to that. So that going forward, if the market actually rolls over, that's more of a warning because we're not matching the seasonality. <laughs> And actually, what this next chart here, too, shows is a little bit of data of preceding midterm elections, kind of the corrections um, that you can see from that, and then performance, kind of what we were looking at before, would be 12 months out from that point in time. Um, so this is just a way, essentially, to look at that table we had before. It's just a little more visual, um, which kind of helps gauge what you're looking at there. Um, and we've kind of showed this before. Um, and the numbers kind of back this up, really, when you look at a lot of the seasonal data. Um, in years like this, January is usually the strongest month, which, I mean, it was a very good month. Um, but you can kind of see at the groupings here, um, it kind of looks like, at least historically, you'll get a little bit of cluster or positive performance more at the beginning of the year. Summer months, a little hit miss. Um, I don't think you can really make much of a determination there. Um, but I guess seasonally, you would expect it to pick up towards the end of the year a little bit. So as far as seasonality, that's all I got. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Great job. You Thank you. So we'll have Dan uh, Borkluver come up. I think Dan is getting more sleep with the exception of Sunday night. So he's got a young daughter at home, I think. Is she sleeping through the night now? She is. Okay, that's another round of applause. So Dan got in at 2.30 on, uh, morning, at, on Monday morning. So I think he's post to sleepiness and ready to present on some relationships that matter. Yes, uh, the sleep is definitely going better with the little one, so I will not complain about that one bit. Um, and it's good, uh, it's good segue actually into kind of what I want to talk about today uh, for my segment, and, and it's really about relationships, right? Relationships, whether it be in our lives right, is kind of the analogy I'm going to use, you know, a father-daughter relationship uh, with my new, my new little one, or uh, whether it be relationships in the market, okay, um, we're going to be using these relationships, okay, to uh, articulate our lives and then articulate how we want to analyze the markets, okay, and so I'm sure all of you guys are sitting at the table right now uh, with some sort of relationship uh, with yourself, right? Um, whether it be a spouse, a friend, uh, daughter, uh, mother, whatever it might be, um, these relationships are going to have pivotal, pivotal uh, really areas in our life. And that's really what I want to highlight with that Donald Clifton uh, quote here on the, on the screen is, uh, and I'll let you guys read it, but I'll get into the uh, market relationships here as well. So. I'm going to start you guys out with 2023 year to date, okay? Relationships within the market. Okay. This is, these numbers are going to be versus the S&P 500, okay? So when you look at this chart, large cap growth, growth, IPOs, year to date versus the S&P 500, doing fairly well, okay? It's more of the growth side of the market. Now, if you look at some of the struggling in areas in the market, it's going to be more of your value type of uh, relationships in the market, okay? I'm going to get into a little bit on why that might be and what we've seen uh, this year so far, 
Uh, but really the highlight that I'm getting into is really just started is growth versus value. That's, that's where our team uh, really likes to start a lot of uh, our relationship analysis is growth versus value. Okay, 2023, again, year-to-date chart here. We're looking at some of the key growth versus value ETFs that we follow. You're going to see uh, more of the growth type names uh, coming back around and outperforming some of the value structure. Okay, 2022 and even la- latter half of 21 was a lot of value outperformance. You just got done hearing about bear markets uh, and how they operate. We saw a lot of value outperformance you know, over the last couple of years, year and a half. More recently now, in, in Q1 of this year, we've seen some of that growth start to come back onto the table. Okay. Is it the end all be all right now? Is it is it the relationship that we really want to lean on in terms of growth over value? TBD on that. This chart does, I think, a really good job of, of showing that. So this is going to be uh, iShares, okay, iShares, the IUSG growth ETF versus uh, iShares uh, uh, value ETF, okay. And right now you're going to see in this relationship, I have these two yellow dash lines, okay, and then going the horizontal dash lines going across the screen. Um, and we're at the upper end of this range right now, okay. If we're above that 1.21 in this ratio, okay, meaning uh, growth is continuing to outperform value, we're going to want to be favoring that in our portfolios, okay. If we're not, if we're below 1.21 and still stuck in this range, it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a balance area to, that uh, Dave was kind of alluding to earlier. Okay, and then of course, if we're below the 1.13 all the way down uh, where we just came from at the beginning of 2023, if we're below that, we're going to be back on that value train. Okay, that value train is going to be outperforming growth. We need to be aware of that, right? Looking out at a one year, I'm just going to check my time and make sure we get this. Uh, one year performance versus the S&P. Again, this is going to be kind of highlighting that, that longer term structure that I just got done talking about, where value has still shown that outperformance versus the S&P 500. You're going to see a very different picture on these numbers, right? Quality, large cap value, high dividend yield, all at the top of the screen in terms of green outperformance numbers. At the bottom, IPOs. Uh, large cap growth, momentum, small caps, a lot of your more aggressive growthy type um, names on a one year plus basis still very much struggling on those return numbers. Which kind of gets us into the small versus large, so style box perspective, okay? Again, I'm going to kind of bring it back to these yellow dashed horizontal lines. And the, what this chart gives us is small SLY, so a small cap ETF, versus the S&P 500. We've just had an 11% really outperformance, I guess you could say, from the S&P 500 versus small caps here, really through the last, I would say, two months. Uh, We had some outperformance in small caps uh, to start 2023, uh, but with this whole banking financial situation, uh, that's going to be kind of like the headline news, right? Uh, and I'll kind of break down some of the some of the uh, sector analysis of small caps. But small caps in general have struggled recently, okay, versus the S&P 500, right? So again, calling your attention back to the yellow dashed horizontal lines, we're sitting currently below this critical inflection zone of that 0.2022. If we're below that, okay. We're gonna still we're gonna we're gonna still be out of small caps in general. We're not really gonna be interested in small caps at all. Okay, we're gonna be favoring other uh, large cap players in the market more than likely if we're if we're interested at all at that point. If we're back above this 0.2243 at the top where we were at the start of, of 2023, okay, now we're now we're talking small caps are on our radar more from an aggressive standpoint. We wanna be owning small caps versus something like the S&P 500, okay? And again, these are all relative relationships I want to point you to, okay? So on an absolute value, which we're not really talking about right now, but from a relative value, that's where this analysis lies. And here's kind of that sector breakdown, okay? From a sector-specific standpoint, you'll notice some big differences 
on the left hand side versus the right hand side. Left hand side is going to be your small caps. Okay. Right hand side is going to be your bigger uh, S and P 500. Notice financials a heavy weighting in small caps. Okay. As far as a year to date return number from small caps or financials in small caps, almost 10 percent and really attributing the biggest loss for small caps, okay? Now, you'll notice SP500 also has a, a large uh, financial stake in the top uh, sector analysis, okay? But look at the difference between even the, the large cap SP500 uh, performance of financials, just down over 5% as of this graphic, versus down almost 10% in small caps. There's a there's a big difference in that relative performance just within financials alone, okay? We're not even talking information technology sector, okay? Tech sector in small caps or within small caps gave us like a 6.5% return. But again, from a large cap perspective in the big index, 13.5% return, higher weighting in terms of contributions to, this, to the larger S&P 500 index. These are some of the breakdowns we want to be paying attention to. Uh, and really, that help us explain maybe why things are, are giving us returns the way they are uh, when we look at these relationships, right? I'm going to kind of buzz through these miscellaneous factors, but IPO versus SPX. So the IPO ETF is going to be more, think of them as companies that are recently coming out, uh, coming to the market from a secondary approach, and they're being basketed into this ETF, the IPO. Uh, ETF and really just the biggest, biggest uh, kind of going along the lines of what Dave and, and Kevin described, um, down over almost you know 65, 70 percent from a relative relationship value. This IPO index versus the S and P. Long term hurdle in this relationship, as I kind of know it here with that yellow horizontal line, uh, if we're not above that, yeah, we could we could maybe play IPOs versus the S and P 500 uh, to the long side. Um, below that line and maybe you know maybe have some success but really until we recapture those previous lows uh, and, and recapture that high from middle of 2022 you know are we really that interested in it I, I would understand and uh, kind of ask that question to uh, you guys as well is are we really interested in that if we're below that long-term hurdle uh, as marked by the yellow dash line Another one is going to be a high dividend or dividend type of ETF, okay, marked by VYM. This is another relative relationship, okay. Again, drawing your attention to the to the horizontal line, okay, critical inflection zone. If we're above, if this chart is above that line, okay, we're going to be wanting, we're going to be interested in high dividend or dividend type companies versus the S and P 500. Conversely, if we're below that, we know that hey, the S and P 500 is in favor over these high dividend companies. Something beyond the surface, beyond maybe our uh, understanding is, is affecting that. Uh, but we know in this relative relationship, this is our kind of key hurdle uh, that we either need to hold or, or uh, wanna, wanna see hold, really. And then I'll just quickly do a country breakdown. Year to date, there's, there's certainly some, I'm gonna use the word bifurcation, okay? Um, Country breakdowns, there's a lot of good things happening out there from an international space perspective, but there's also a lot of individual countries that are not performing as well, right? So there's a lot of differences in, in how we're really approaching that perspective on, on a country level basis. And you'll start to notice that we've kind of started to get into, uh, and I know Ian's going to discuss Europe a little bit as far as a, a potential holding or a, an increased holding for us. Um, we're starting to dip our toes into that. This ratio, VEU versus SPX, VEU is a Vanguard International XUS uh, fund, okay? And this, if you remember from our last presentation in January, we had the same chart. And this green, uh, this green oval at the bottom, we're really focused in on this inflection point from a long-term perspective, okay? If we're above, okay, if we're above this horizontal line and above this rate of trend down line, downtrend line in yellow, we're going to be wanting to favor more aggressively international stocks okay, versus our domestic United States types of 
types of stocks, okay? As of right now, we're below it, but again, we're starting to see some things under the surface that could lead to some potential there. And again, Ian's gonna kind of touch on that in the following slides. And then stocks versus bonds, kind of my final slide for you guys. This is a this is a key one that we're watching. So we're using the Russell 3000, okay, notified by RUA, versus uh, AGG, which is more of like a broad core basket of bonds, okay? We're seeing a similar consolidation take place in this ratio that we saw in like 2014, 2015, 2016. We're going to be keying in on this long-term uh, ratio and the trend of this in the months and, and really years to come to kind of give us our, our stance on do we, do we favor bonds or do we favor stocks? Okay. Is our environment going to favor one or the other? This chart is going to give us some, some insight into that whether we, whether we want to be invested in more of a Russell 3000 type equity space or a, a, a bond product uh, like AGG. Okay. With that, I want to bring forward our one and only Ian McMillan. I know uh, we both got in Sunday night. He luckily got in with no delays, so he might be more refreshed than myself, but Please give Ian a round of applause. So as uh, the three gentlemen before me have done a very good job of explaining, you've seen this chart. This is um, the S&P. We've talked about this 10 to 11th month range where we continue to be. Um, right now, as of the day, we're up against uh, that top red line. Um, but yeah, this is the big picture, you know, breaking out of this range has got to be the, at least the second step. So we're above the 200 day moving average, um, getting above 4180 would be the second step. Um, I wish I had more, um, cool, insightful things to tell you than that, that we've just got to break out of range, but that is genuinely, um, all I've got for you, for you from a technical perspective. Same goes for uh, the New York Stock Exchange composite. They have talked about this, uh, long-term treasury. So we get outside of equities to talk about other asset classes. Again, uh, bonds, just like stocks, have gone nowhere and a lot of places over the last year, close to a year. Still no um, truly discernible um, idea yet as to which direction bonds, uh, or at least treasuries, uh, will go in the coming months, weeks and months. The dollar. So this has been a big topic. Uh, dollar weakness has, in theory, uh, been a big boost to the rally we've had in stocks since October. As you can see, the dollar has kind of bottomed out from its downtrend that started in February. Stocks have also found themselves in another sideways range. So we'll see how this relationship plays out. And second, I wanted to talk to you guys uh, about ADVP. Obviously, clients will know this is a pretty large uh, position in our models for clients right now. This is an ETF that we developed a client first and brought it to market first and foremost for our clients um, and second for other advisors um, who may be looking for a similar type of strategy. Uh, so it is a very straightforward, again, Dave likes to use the word trend following. That's exactly what this is. So above a 200-day moving average, it will be involved in stocks. It will own 25 individual stocks based on their pro 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 proprietary ranking system. And when the broad market is in a downtrend below the 200-day, it will move to cash and technically short-term T-bills. It's as close to its cash as you can get um, in the industry. The SEC will not allow you to own 100% cash. And so I talked about the ranking system. 
uh, we start with a pool of 1,000 stocks from the Russell 1000, and that gets whittled down to uh, the top 25 stocks. You don't automatically get replaced if you drop out of the top 25, but there are some, some triggers in there um, that uh, do lead to turnover, not a ton of turnover from week to week. Um, and this is what we are trying to avoid with the ETF, these blue circles being below the 200 day. Uh, this is what the strategy is built to do, and then obviously participating in stocks uh, if the broad market is above the 200-day moving average. So let's look at the S&P. You guys have seen this chart a million times today. And when the ETF actually launched on November uh, 4th of 2022. So we've got our 200-day moving average. The five-day blue five-day moving average is below the 200-day moving average, the strategy will go to cash. So strategy, a little choppy, um, early of 2022, goes to cash early April uh, for quite a few months, stays in cash even during the big August rally. Obviously, we got no signal there. Um, almost got a signal back here in December. So... Um, this is a trend following strategy. This has um, not been a trending environment, right? We've made that point pretty clear today. Uh, so the ETF launches, it launches in cash because that is where the strategy sits. You don't get to pick your market environment. Uh, we started on this project back in January. It took us about nine to 10 months to complete. Again, we don't get to pick the market, and we're not going to sit there and say, oh, well, let's, let's launch this product when we feel like there's a more favorable market. It doesn't really work that way. So you jump into the pool, and you get the hand that is dealt to you. That continues to be a sideways hand. Uh, so got into stocks here in late January. Of course, stocks peaked a few days later. Uh, out of stocks. Uh, in mid-March and then back again in, in late March where we continue to be. But that's a, a brief kind of broad synopsis on the ETF. Uh, so it will go to cash if stocks continue to roll over and there's a third leg lower in uh, you know, a recession and all these things we hear about. I have no idea if that happens, but know that should we go below this orange line, uh, that strategy will go back to cash. So where do we go from here? Uh, and I've got one minute, so I'm going to go as fast as possible. Again, there's really nothing to do until you're either in a green circle <clears throat> or a red circle. Uh, we've, you know, we've covered what the big, uh, the largest stocks in the S&P have done year to date. So the S&P, without its largest seven stocks, it's actually down 6% for the year. Industrial average, Dow Jones Industrial Average, again, until we get above 34,200, where we've been multiple times over the last year and have been unable to break through. Until that behavior changes, there is nothing to do. The Russell 2000, nothing to do until you're either in a green or a red bubble. Same with treasuries, crude oil, range bound, We'll see if we can get below 72. Your favorite president told the world that's where he was going to buy oil. So we'll see if we actually get down there. Um, and Europe. Dan touched a little bit on Europe. So Europe we've got uh, is getting interesting after 12 years of severe underperformance. Uh, it has had a nice rally over the last month. We wanted to make clear that there's still tons of potential uh, to go from here. So that was a little bit unfair to Ian, because we gave him not a lot of time. So thank you, Ian, for that. I appreciate it. We, we are not going to uh, do our Q&A out of respect for your time, so we're going we're gonna to wrap it up. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, my team's going to head back to the office and, and do their regular day jobs, uh, which is not presenting or finding humor or any of those things. Um, before I forget, though, please be careful walking out to your cars. Um, Jake noticed he was in back and noticed that some of the, it's like an icy hail that's out there and they're just standing water. 
So please be careful um, walking out to your car. But I did want to leave you with a couple uh, final thoughts because, you know, from time to time people will say, okay, what's next? What are what do we need to be thinking about? So when we're in, you know, range-bound markets, you don't get to pick those markets. Similar to my daughter doesn't get to pick it, an ACL injury. But she's back. Of course, somebody in the show. Um, but the adaptive game plan, we have our ranges defined, like Ian talked about. 4180, we talked about it a million times. If you listen to the podcast, you're probably sick of it. Like, you're probably, why do I even listen to this anymore? Um, because here are certain quotes taken from there. Until we get above 4180, 4200, there's really not a lot to talk about as far as when do we get to grow accounts again. Because really, that's the bottom line question, isn't it? When we go through a, a, a period of underperformance where an account moves sideways to down, when does it come back? So there's really a couple scenarios when we look at this. Uh, and then, again, this is from the March monthly market update. It talks about the three steps, how we're adhering to them. So I hope you're consuming some of these things, taking in the podcast or reading the market updates. It gives we're very transparent as to how we're taking care of uh, client accounts. But it's really this simple. It really is. We can start growing accounts again, either in one of two scenarios. Back above 4180 and 4200, we can start growing accounts again. That's the shorter time frame scenario. The longer time frame scenario is because now we know what game we're playing in, what the boundaries are. If we break back below the 200 day moving average, the ETF will switch to cash. We will be moving the, anything else that's in the account to cash. And we want nothing to do with stocks below 36.80, 36.50. And the reason why I say longer is because as this correction could unfold, again, I'm not predicting this. I'm just saying if it does this, we have a game plan for it. And we can buy at lower prices now that we have our field defined. That one would take a little bit longer because most likely we would be accumulating stocks, you know, 6 to 12 months whereas this could be in a couple days. Does that make sense the way I'm describing that? So we're always going to see discipline to our process. We know we want to invest with the direction of the trend. Unfortunately, right now, there's trendlessness. Once we have a trend, we'll take advantage of it. And we're, going to use man we're going to manage risk using that Bayesian approach. As more data comes in, it becomes more important. And we're going to stay disciplined. That's another way of saying staying the course. This isn't my first time being through a drawdown or a sideways market. My money is invested same way. It's frustrating, but you stick to the process and come out the other side um, uh, better for it as long as we keep the longer-term picture perspective. You have a feedback form, so please make sure you fill that out with any information or questions you have. A great way to do this, if you have a question, too, as well, since I'm only hanging out for 10 to 15 minutes, you could put it on that form, too, if you have a question. And Sarah will make, Sarah and Heather will make sure that those get scanned to me. You can also do that electronically. Next month, it's Eric's team. I'm very excited about it. The insurance team's going to be coming up here, Eric and Katie. It's going to be fantastic. Um, Probably the guy with the loud shirt on back there, Chris, will be up here too. Um, if you don't get a chance, if you get a chance as you're walking out, please check out Chris's shirt. It is fantastic. <laughs> Last but not least, again, this is all about putting the pieces together uh, for your puzzle. If this is something you're interested in, you can schedule a no fee consultation. It's pretty low pressure. If you've been in our office, you realize how low pressure it is. Work with your client first team, get a customized plan. You do that ongoing and enjoy that financial confidence. So thank you very much for your time. I do apologize that we went seven months or seven, seven months. I'm thinking in ranges now, seven minutes long. Thank you for your time.